You've got it all wrong, man. I just want to die. Clown! No! <laughs> We're getting closer to the station. Even so, we'll probably run into a few monsters on the way. Hmm. Huh. There's a face that screams, so what? Eh, I fought scarier things in my sleep. All right now, so we have Aerith in our party for the first time, and we can get an example, or we get a chance to see what her stats look like. Now, she hasn't had any of her weapons upgraded or anything like that, but you can look at the base stats and kind of get an idea of the kind of character she is. She is a casting character. She doesn't have a lot of physical strength, but she has a lot of sort of magical powers, magical uh, magic attack and magic defense and that kind of stuff. In the original game, there wasn't any significant differences between the, your characters, your party members, in their abilities. And this had a lot to do with the fact that the materia system existed, which allowed you to assign specific uh, spells or magical attacks to really any character, as long as you had a materia slot that it could be slotted into. Now, this is a pretty big difference from the earlier games in the Final Fantasy series, where all of your characters had a specific class of some sort. Some were more powerful with magic, others were more powerful with physical attacks or special abilities or whatever kind of combination you can think of or find. Final Fantasy VII kind of did away with that. In a certain sense, it still existed because you had certain characters like Tifa, which was based on the monk class, or I guess Cloud was a fighter, or... and. Um, I don't know, yeah, you had the different characters with their differences, but they were not nearly as significant because they could all have magic and all these special abilities with, like, the yellow materia. So the differences in the original seven came down to just minor stat differences. The one character who I feel they actually went almost, anyway, almost all in with turning her into a specific class was Aerith, who came across as sort of like a red mage kind of character. And in fact, she's even raring, kind of wearing kind of a pinkish color, so I guess they wanted to signify that a little bit. She was based more along the lines of a character that you wanted to have magic on, and they stuck her in the back row, which limited her attack power by half, but also... Uh, for non-ranged attacks limited her damage by half that she received. So she was kind of a fragile character. She had low physical attack, she had low um, low defense and all that kind of stuff, but she had higher levels of magic attack than the other characters. So you slot her up with a lot of magic materia, and she's really good at using that because she has a higher magic stat than everybody. Then you look at her limit breaks, which were based around the idea of buffing and healing your party members as opposed to attacking the other uh, the enemies which was a pretty big change from uh, all the other characters like you use limit breaks for the most part to boost your damage you take some damage during the fight your limit gauge fills and then you can unleash a powerful attack Aerith it was about healing your party or whatever buffing them or something and that was a pretty big the pretty big difference right there so Aerith was really the only kind of specialized character now there were differences with other characters like Tifa for example had a poor magic stat so she wasn't ideal for using magic but the fact that you could socket say the cure materia in one of her weapons or armor and she could use healing magic meant that even though she wasn't really the best at it she was still useful enough as a mage character that you could um, you could use her in that way Aerith was maybe the one example of a good class though because her attack was terrible but her magic was really good so cloud you don't know the slums that well do you compared to you no training grounds barracks Battlefields? That's the world I know. <laughs> you sound proud of that. 
Cloud did work for Shinra for a time. Spoiler alert, he wasn't a soldier, but he did work for Shinra for a time as one of their sort of generic troopers. And I imagine during that time, he spent time working or living or training or something in the Midgar. But that doesn't mean he spent any time in the slums. Aerith, on the other hand, has lived there her entire life, so she must know it pretty damn well. Stations there. I can see that. Oh? Thought the world you knew didn't include stations. Ha ha. She's very playful with the way that she talks to Cloud. No, I guess she was like that in the original game, but since it wasn't voiced, there wasn't as much banter between the characters. So there wasn't as many opportunities for that kind of thing to come out. We poured so much of our blood and sweat into building that reactor. Now I can't believe this is happening. If you would all just please calm down. Hey, what the hell's going on? Check it out, come Mom. on. There's no need to shout. Popular place. Yeah, well, it's got a good view of the reactor. It's on fire! In a show. They know that. Don't worry. Oh, didn't expect to see you here. Huh? Um, yeah. Oh, on your way home from the church? That's right. Well, I'm glad you're okay. Did any debris hit the church? Not debris, no. That's something at least, but you may not be so lucky next time. Hey, you know a way to get topside other than the train? Sorry, can't say I do. Figured as much. Just my own. That goddamn pain in the ass. This is kind of like a rehash of the scene we had seen as we had exited the first reactor after it exploded. You got an unfortunate view of all of the collateral damage that resulted in the explosion of the reactor. Now here, down here, it isn't quite as bad. There wasn't debris that came down all over the place and just disrupted everybody's lives, burned down their homes, and killed people and all that kind of stuff. Here, it's more... I don't know, subdued, because the people in the slums aren't as a part of the world that exists up there. A lot of people are just stuck somewhere because the train isn't running right now. I guess after the bombing, I don't know, either the power isn't working or they're, they don't want to run the trains for some reason. Uh, of course, the truth is known now to Cloud and the other members of Avalanche that Shinra was actually responsible for the bomb going off, or at least it's reasonable enough to suspect that they caused the big-ass explosion, and they weren't really, or Avalanche wasn't as directly responsible for all of the negative effects that had gone on. Of course, uh, I don't know if that's supposed to make them feel any better or not, but Cloud doesn't seem to be too affected by, by everything. He's pretty good at shutting himself off from everything that's going on around him. Though I guess he won't be taking the train back to Sector 7. He'll have to... he'll have to run his way there. This kind of train scene didn't exist in the original game. In fact, I don't think there was a train station in Sector 5. They had to go to Sector 7 to find a train station. Huh? Wait. Deck is all clear! Rope's good! Go! Pull him up! <laughs> Let's go! Another Turk. A real man on a mission. On the hunt, more like. For me, or you? Don't know. Don't care. Then, let's stick to the back streets? Ah. There will be monsters. <sighs> Better than Shinra.
explosion of flavor beyond your wildest There's a Shinra dump site up ahead. Not the kind of place anyone would ever choose to hang around in. But a great place to lay low. Aerith is playful and almost childlike as she is, isn't stupid. She knows that Cloud is up to something, and I guess so the explosion good? happening right over her church and this guy, dressed in an elite soldier uniform but having no loyalty to Shinra, fell through the roof of her church and landed in uh, her flower bed, must have had something to do with it. Though she doesn't really say as much. No telling where they'll come from. Monsters instinctively target weaker prey. Hmm. You'd better watch out then, Cloud. I suspect all of these things where you have to shimmy your way through a narrow space is just kind of a way of slowing down your character's progression so you're not advancing through the map too quickly. That way the system has time to load up the next section. There haven't really been any loading screens that I've seen where, except for like between cutscenes and all that kind of shit, where the screen just hits a loading screen, or like in the original game where it fades out and then fades back in in the next screen. They're doing a pretty good job of disguising that stuff with those little shimmy sections as well as those slow door switches that Cloud has to activate. I guess the next generation consoles will be much better about uh, not having to get stuck at things like this. That didn't work. Maybe it's broken? Pretty sure this path we're on loops around too, so... Hmm, wonder if we can move this. I knew it! Things like that, though, aren't really what I was talking about. Because once you pushed it out of the way, you could run past it over and over again without getting stalled out. But there are other switches that seem to be, like, time-gating things to slow you down as you advance through. Other than that, it would just feel like kind of an unnecessary distraction. You know, I get that this isn't the normal route that Eris was planning on taking back from the church back home that when she set out in the morning to go to the church but the other areas that we right after we had left the church and got off the got off of the um roof tops seemed kind of dangerous must have been a new breed how do you figure because they went for the stronger prey he doesn't even respond to that I think it's kind of weird to look at the layout of the Midgar slums and realize that it's kind of, even though Midgar itself is one larger city, the slums seem to be more divided up into a number of individual towns that are separated by unpopulated areas. Which is weird to think of them as being unpopulated areas because the majority of them aren't built up in any kind of a way. This infrastructure set up and buildings and all that kind of stuff. Now it's sort of said, I think it was, uh, I don't remember if it was said in this game, but it was said by Jesse in the original that there used to be town, uh, the city was built over a bunch of towns and each one had a name and they eventually, people just stopped using the names and started referring to the towns by the sector number the number of the plate that they were hidden under. But it kind of looks like maybe at one point the population of the slums was quite a bit higher. Because we're moving through an area here that has stuff built up. As well as like when we were hopping around on the rooftops in the last episode. Those were a bunch of buildings that were constructed that nobody was living in. They weren't factories. There weren't places where anybody works. They were just abandoned. Okay, so why are these places abandoned? Well, okay, at one point the population of the slums must have been much higher, and these areas must have been populated when they're not now. And it wasn't um, infrastructure and houses and everything that were built up before the plate was, because I would assume that when the plate went up is when the slums turned into this poverty-stricken hellhole. And 
This is very much a shanty town that we're running around in. So, I don't imagine everything would have been built like this prior to the construction of the plate. So, plate got built, all this other stuff got built down here, and then it was abandoned later. There, check it out. The heart of the slums. Still a fair ways off. Well, we did take a detour. Getting tired? Nah. Me, I'm feeling a bit hungry. How about you? Amazed. You're in for a treat when we make it back. Don't have time for that. You'll want to make time for my mom's cooking. And that's the final word on it. We'll get home quick and eat ourselves stupid. Aerith is older than Cloud and Tifa by a little bit. Not, not a whole lot, but I think she's a year older than Cloud and two years older than Tifa. But her personality seems to be the one that is probably the least mature in a lot of ways. Of the three, Tifa kind of has the most mature personality, and Cloud sort of lands somewhere in the middle. And it's kind of a weird way to think about that, because in a, in a way, eh, Aerith has had, all three of them have had kind of rough childhoods. But in a sense, Eris has had the most uh, most stable childhood because she's had a mother. It wasn't her biological mother, uh, but she did have a stable home life. She had a place where she lived growing up. It may have been in the hellhole that is the slums, but she got to spend her time there. She has a community that she's a part of. She has a um, adoptive mother that loves her and all that. But she has gone through hardships in her own way. Now, Cloud and Tifa have gone through pretty much the same hardships. Their hometowns were destroyed. Their, all their loved ones were killed. But Cloud has sort of fallen into kind of a, a fantasy of his life. And Tifa is the only one that has just been confronted with reality the entire time. So I guess she has the most mature personality as a result of that. But Eris' personality is very outgoing. She's very friendly, and she seems to have developed a rather strong attachment to Cloud pretty quickly. Now, I don't know if she really does this with everybody she runs into. If she immediately has to make, become the best friend of every person she ever meets. But she seems to have taken a, a strong liking to Cloud, at least as far as we can see. Now, I don't know how many other people really believe the same thing that I do. I mentioned this in the playthrough of the original game, and I may have said it in previous episodes. But a lot of it has to do, I think, to do with the kind of personality that Cloud has taken on. The persona that he has adopted as part of his delusion of being a soldier. So, spoiler alert, Cloud was never in Soldier. He has based his entire personality, though, on the idea that he was, and, well, how does he do that? Well, he actually knew a soldier back when he started working for Shinra. He was friends with a guy named Zack Fair. Now, Zack is dead. He died probably a couple of days before the start of the game. So, Cloud and Zack were good friends, Zack ends up dying, and Cloud adopts this delusion that he was in Soldier, and he was a sort of elite soldier working for Shinra. Well, okay, so how does he adopt that delusion? Well, he bases his personality and his memories off of what he knew of Zack. Aerith knew Zack as well. In fact, he was her boyfriend. And he disappeared five years earlier, and she never found out what happened to him. So all of a sudden, this guy shows up, even wearing Zack's uniform, although I guess she'll never know that. Actually wearing Zack's uniform with a personality based on Zack's, that has to spark some kind of level of familiarity with him, even if his personality is coming across as a little bit off. So she loves this guy, he disappears, and then, all of a sudden, this other guy shows up five years later with kind of the same personality, with the same background, who, in a sense, kind of thinks he's the same guy. And 
I guess that could explain away some of the reason why that she finds herself so attracted to him. And we'll see in uh, later episodes that he tries to leave. He tries to leave her behind and go on to Sector 7, and she doesn't, uh, she kind of doesn't let him. She sort of follows him around. Now, that may not necessarily just be her following him around because of her attraction to him or that he reminds her of somebody that she loved. She also seems to have this kind of desire for adventure on her own. Now, she talked in the last episode about how she could never see herself leaving Midgar. I mean, it's a trashy-ass place, but it's home to her. But she also seems to have this desire to want to go and find adventure on her own. So, okay, here's this guy. Clearly, he's up to no good of some kind. And even though she is sort of a moral person, she doesn't... Uh, she follows this guy around who clearly had something to do with the bombing of the power plant. But he's going off and he's adventure, adventuring of some sort. And she sort of tethers herself to him because he's going and he's doing stuff and... I guess she wants to be a part of that. We'll see a number of instances in the coming couple of episodes where Aerith has had plenty of opportunity to uh, separate herself from Cloud and go back home. And she just keeps deciding, nope, not doing that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm part of this now. I guess later on, when it becomes clear that Shinra is done playing around, just spying on her, and wants to outright kidnap her, that she decides that living in Midgar isn't really safe anymore, and she can't just go back living with her mother. It has to leave. That might have something to do with her decisions later. But in this this time frame, it's it doesn't make any sense. Nice work. Way to think ahead. As it turns out, I was actually supposed to go and try the door first. So, since I didn't try that door first, and I just went straight over and unlocked it from the other side, she comments, Way to think ahead. Guess we're home free. No need for thanks. I'd rather get paid. Hmm? You're getting paid right now. Hmm? Wow, she thinks so highly of herself. Now, she did promise him a date for escorting her back home and getting her away from the Turks, and she did in the original game also. But, uh, I mean, now, wow. <laughs> just just being around her is pay all the payment that he needs for fighting off a Turk. Fighting a bunch of monsters, bringing her back home. I'm like, yep, just, uh, just you being around me is all the payment you need. <laughs> I mean, I guess he, uh, he agreed to those conditions and terms, but still... be able to relax a little now. Don't forget about the Turks. Ah. Could come at us any time. Keep an eye out. All right, we've reached the town in Sector 5, and I guess somebody in this town are sick. If you don't get that reference, we can't be friends. So, this is my mom, Elmira. And this is Cloud, my bodyguard. Uh, hi. Take good care of her? That's my job. Or was my job. 